we have, are in our study in Romans, and we're in chapter 1. And uh, we are in the latter half of chapter 1, which is a, a very crucial chapter, a very crucial section of that chapter, where uh, Paul introduced, has already introduced his purpose, his topic is to encourage and enrich the faith of the church to whom he's writing, and that letter to that church in Rome, 2,000 years ago comes down to us, uh, the same purpose is shared with us to enrich our faith as we walk with the Lord by faith. Paul says his ministry as an apostle of Jesus Christ is to bring about the obedience of faith among all the nations. And so we are uh, among those people who come to Jesus Christ in a relationship which the scripture describes as is meant to be an obedience of faith. And the language obedience of faith refers to the kingdom plan of God. If we were to turn to Ephesians, Ephesians 1 says he has a plan in which all things in heaven and earth will be united in Christ. <clears throat> in Genesis 49, that purpose of uniting everything in the Messiah is described as all the peoples being obedient to him. So Paul, who at the end of the book of Acts is preaching the kingdom, is teaching people about the kingdom of God, says that his purpose in writing to Rome is to bring about that obedience of faith that belongs to that kingdom which was prophesied in the scripture. Now, he has this quotation in Romans 1, 17, that the righteous shall live by faith quotation coming out of the prophecy of Habakkuk, a prophecy that was made in the context of the coming day of God's wrath. So the obedience of faith is a living by faith in the context of the coming wrath of God. But in verse 18 of chapter 1, which is our section, the wrath of God's already being revealed. It's already being revealed against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. And this is being done in the sense that God hands them over to their own passions and sins. They're culpable for their unrighteousness and ungodliness. But the judgment of God begins even now in the present as he hands people over to their own sins. And there is this progression of the development of sin. At the end of this, Romans 1, 18 to 32, in the last couple of verses, and you have it there on your outline, or on your handout, he talks about the all nature, all manner of evil and wickedness. When you read the description of those characteristics there, they're pretty much a description of society in which we live, and they are common human sins. But in the process, Paul also talks about the problem of homosexuality. Now this is the third week we've been in this passage. The last couple of weeks we focused on this and last week we focused particularly on what Paul says, starting in uh, verses uh, 26, uh, where he says, Romans 1, 26, For this reason God gave them up to dishonorable passions. For the women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature, and the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. Now, we looked at the verses very carefully last week. I want to look at the topic a little more in detail today in terms of how it has impacted our culture. 
And as we do that, what I want you to notice in on your on your handout in the text that we have before you, I want to call attention to these aspects of the text. First of all, in um, in verse twenty, he's talking about uh, the things that have been made. Um, verse verse twenty, he talks about the creation of the world and the things that have been made. He's talking about God the Creator. And the wrath of God is directed against the unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth about God the Creator. The whole basis for our conversation is that God is the Creator. He's the Maker of all of us. Look down at verse 25. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator. Uh, there is a defection. There is a uh, suppression uh, of the truth regarding God as our creator. And in the passage, passage we're looking at in verses 26 and 27, notice the word natural. <coughs> Verse 26, God gave them up to dishonorable passions. The women exchanged natural. There's the word. Relations for those that are contrary to nature. You can underline that. And likewise, the men gave up natural relations with women consumed or passion for one another. What I want you to see in these things is this passage is presenting God, the Creator. And He created us for natural relations. And uh, what we're being told in the passage is that people who exchange the truth about God, the Creator, for a lie there is a judgment of God in the <coughs> handing over, the giving over of people into their own passions. And one of the ways in which that's manifested is the creation, human creation of unnatural relations. That is, relationships that are contrary to nature. The reason why I want to underscore that is because there are people in our society today that contest that point that this is not an unnatural thing. From the standpoint of the scripture, it's an unnatural thing that's um, due to the lack of recognition of God the Creator. Now, let's pray together as we jump into our study today. Lord, we're talking about an issue today that is so prevalent in our culture. And for many of us, <coughs> it is surprising as to how quickly and how recently this has become such a pervasive issue in our culture. And Lord, we need great wisdom in not only understanding where things are, but also that we might be witnesses of Christ. For in truth, from you is a salvation that is sufficient for every need and covers every sin and brings forgiveness and recreation and renewal by your Holy Spirit. So Lord, give us wisdom about these things and we commit our time to you in Christ's name. Amen. So what I want to do is to talk to you about how this has become an issue in our culture. And so I want to look at two things. Number one, I want to just review for you the history of um, homosexuality and the law in the United States. And then I want to look at what conception of the self and the person is going along with this. I'm doing all of this in light of the text that we, we, uh, we spent time looking at last week and we've just kind of uh, reminded ourselves and highlighted 
here today of what God the Creator has created and, and what kind of um, judgment manifests itself in human society. So I'm going to call this from Baker to Obergefell, uh, recognition of homosexuality in America. We're going to start uh, in 1971. Remember the 70s? Uh, so uh, we talk about the 60s, but you know, not all the 60s were the 60s. Uh, what we refer to as the 60s really came in the latter half of that decade. And the changes, the cultural changes that became, were becoming manifest in the late 60s really set in to society in the 70s. 1971, there was this, um, this the court decision, Baker versus Nelson, and it had to do with this in Minnesota, state of Minnesota. Uh, the, the Minnesota Supreme Court had ruled that uh, same-sex marriage is a uh, rejection of same-sex marriage is constitutional. There had actually been a, a contesting of the state law against same-sex marriage in 1971 in Minnesota. And the state Supreme Court ruled that it is certainly constitutional to reject that. Okay. That went all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court and they affirmed the state of Minnesota in this. Now this, it is constitutional to reject this, which is a uh, non-recognition of same-sex marriage. However, uh, with the, the, the sexual revolution of the late 60s and on into the 70s, uh, there was increasing activity and interest in homosexuality, which is why the case came up in the first place in 1971. But on the history of this thing, we have to recognize 1973, <clears throat> Roe v. Wade, which you'll recognize as the Supreme Court decision regarding abortion. Why is this of interest to homosexuality in U.S. culture? Because what happened there uh, in the court ruling was the recognition of a right, which we now refer to as the right of privacy. And it was the way in which the right of privacy was recognized in the Constitution that sets up uh, the discussion on homosexuality. Uh, in the 14th Amendment of the Constitution, there is this phrase. Now, I just have to say a disclaimer here. I am not a lawyer. I'm not an attorney. Okay. I'm just a theologian. Okay. But I'm reading this, all right? So here in Section 1 of the 14th Amendment, no state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privilege or immunities of citizens of the U.S., nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. The focus here came on the notion of liberty. No state, nor neither the, the U.S. nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property. Liberty here was being interpreted to refer to rights that we have. Well, these rights are defined in the Bill of Rights. But by this time, the court was recognizing rights that are not defined in the Bill of Rights. And they believe that there are implicit in the notion of ordained liberty, rights pertaining to marriage, procreation, contraception, family relations, child rearing, child education. And so these things not specified in the Constitution were already uh, recognized in the culture 
And so, consequently, um, there are rights in this area, private areas of life, that uh, come to the individual. Justice O'Connor, speaking for the majority, Roe v. Ray wrote, uh, there is, um, um, in the realm of personal liberty, there is a realm of personal liberty which the government may not enter. At the heart of liberty is the right to define one's own concept of existence, of meaning, of the universe, of the mystery of human life. Beliefs um, on these matters um, could not define the attributes of personhood were they, fo were they forced under compulsion by the state. So there are notions of personhood that are contained in the notion of liberty that are up to the individual to define. And so allowing people to define that, the court does not go in there to bring about the the force or power of the state, which means that the state can go in there and legislate on those issues. Now, when you think about that, there's certain things that seem right about that. But how far does that go and where does it go? 1986, Bowers versus Hardwick. Uh, this is an interesting because now we're in 1986. We are 13 years after Roe v. Wade, and the U.S. Supreme Court has a case before it on whether or not uh, states can proscribe, that is, uh, prohibit sodomy. And the U.S. Supreme Court rules that states can proscribe, they can prohibit sodomy in 1986, okay, in spite of, you know, what's been said so far in Roe v. Wade. And I want to read you a statement made by the Chief Justice, uh, Warren Berger. Remember Warren Berger? Okay, the Berger Court. <clears throat> by the way, this is an interesting book here. Uh, Alan Sears and Craig Ostin. This was published by Lifeway, by uh, B and H, uh, 2002. So it's old, okay? Entitled the Homosexual Agenda, and it's a very interesting um, survey. Uh, takes mainly a story approach to the issue. This is interesting. Um, to the way in which this agenda has come up in the culture. Well, uh, here is what Chief Justice Warren Berger said in the Bowers versus Hardwick case, 1986. Decisions of individuals relating to homosexual conduct have been subject to state intervention throughout the history of Western civilization. Condemnation of those practices is fairly rooted in Judeo-Christian moral and ethical standards. William Blackstone, uh, who was um, very important for the development of philosophy of law in, in the U.S., described the infamous crime against nature as an offense of deeper malignity than rape, a heinous act the very mention of which is a disgrace to human nature and a crime not fit to be named. To hold that the act of homosexual sodomy is somehow protected as a fundamental right would be to cast aside millennia of moral teaching. That's Warren Berger in 1986 and Bowers versus Hardwick. But as you can tell, the culture is already in the process of changing. <clears throat> After that decision, 1987, 1989, 
there were publications by um, homosexual activists that decided to take on this issue in an activist way in the United States to change cultural <laughs> opinion. And the, the, the agenda was fairly lay, well laid out uh, with the purpose of uh, recasting the whole issue here as a matter of victimization, that uh, homosexuals are victimized in the culture and, um, and that consequently uh, it is a matter of justice related uh, to the accomplishments of uh, anti-discrimination purposes coming out of uh, the civil rights legislation back in the late 60s. And so um, I want to present this as a matter of justice and victimization and also with very clear intents to begin to channel money toward the promotion of anti-discrimination against uh, homosexuals. It was also being said that 10% of the population were, um, were involved in homosexuality. You ever hear that percentage? Uh, it was not true and is not true today, uh, although it's growing today. Uh, the truth was really more around 1 to 2% more like 1.1%. 1, 1 uh, but these are the things that are being said. So here we are, we're in the late 80s now. That's not too long ago, is it? Okay. So we're in the late 80s, move along on our little history. In 1993, there was uh, the publication uh, by a geneticist, Dean Hammer of the U.S. Uh, National Cancer Institute published a paper suggesting an area on the X chromosome called the XQ28 which contained a gay gene. You ever hear that this was genetic? Okay. Well, it's based on this. So, 1987, 1989, we have beginning of, um, of concentrated activism. 1993 comes out this study that says, hey, it looks to be genetic. Consequently, if it's genetic, then it's not contrary to nature, is it? So it's part of nature. That changes things in a lot of people's thinking. 1996, however, there is passed in the United States a Defense of Marriage Act. Remember that? We had a Defense of Marriage Act. Bill Clinton was president. Actually <clears throat> managed to get this passed, defending marriage. Section 2 of the Defense of Marriage Act denied same-sex marriage. So we're in the 90s, we're mid-90s, not too long ago, is it? 1998, the Association of, uh, the American Psychological Association uh, affirms that there is a biological basis for uh, homosexuality. Now already back in 1973, at Roe v. Wade, and Justice O'Connor saying we've got this constitutional right, constitutional right to define who we are, you know, our, our, our identity as persons. So in 1973, the APA says we're no longer defining homosexuality as a mental disorder. Up to that time, they did. So it's no longer defined that way. On one day, you have a mental problem, the next day you're fine. <laughs> it's just normal, okay? And we've all taken the vote and decided. Um, but in 1998, all right, so uh, that's now being reinforced and reinforced by them agreeing with the uh, Hammer uh, paper that there's a genetic basis for this. 2003. 
Lawrence versus Texas. Uh, notice how Texas keeps coming in. The Roe v. Wade was right here in Dallas. You know who Wade was? He was the district attorney right here in, in Dallas. Okay. Um, Lawrence versus Texas. Um, this is the court case that overturns Bowers versus Hardwick. Uh, Texas had an anti sodomy law. 2003, the Supreme Court struck it down. It's unconstitutional. In uh, 1986, Bowers versus Hardwick, it is constitutional to proscribe, to prohibit sodomy. In 2003, it's no longer constitutional to prohibit that. So Bowers versus Hardwick has been struck down. By this time, the, the opinion and the culture is changing uh, with the activism. Part of this activism, by the way, <clears throat> it's a very careful agenda that was laid out, and that was to recruit money from corporations. Uh, to uh, not discriminate against sexual orientation. It's not just uh, against uh, sexual identity, but sexual orientation, and to add that to their non-discriminatory practices. So they worked on corporations to add that into their employee manuals, and then recruited, set up foundations to recruit money uh, to then be a funnel to give to other organizations. Um, and we're able to do that, and in the process of giving money to other organizations, charitable organizations required them to put into their charters anti-discrimination practices against sexual orientation. Okay. In the meantime, uh, the whole entertainment industry is changing to highlight this feature. And so here's how things change, and uh, Sears uh, points this out in the book, that in, um, in uh, 1983, 30% of the population by surveys indicated that they knew somebody who was homosexual. Only 30%. In the year 2000, 73% said they did. In 1985, <coughs> Uh, on the question in surveys, would you be disappointed if a son or daughter identified themselves as homosexual? 90% of those surveys said they would be terribly disappointed. But in the year 2000, only 30%, only 37% um, said that. 73% said they knew somebody who was gay. 37% said they would be upset. This is a change of attitude in the culture that's taking place. And it's being reflected in the laws. 2009, now this becomes interesting. The American Psychological Association publishes a paper that says, you know what? You know, that, that study on the gay gene, um, there's reason to doubt that. And just, just put out there that we don't really think the evidence is there. However, most people remember the 2009 APA ruling for this. Uh, <clears throat> we believe that uh, therapy to help a person change out of that lifestyle is counterproductive and should not be practiced. So two things were happening at the same time, recognizing that there are studies that are casting doubt on this genetic basis, but at the same time saying, uh, we don't think that there should be any therapy to try to get people to come out of uh, that practice. 2013, that's not very long ago, is it? 2013 is U.S. versus Windsor. And this is uh, the U.S. Supreme Court struck down the Defense of Marriage Act. Okay, the 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 1996 Defense of Marriage Act struck it down, which of course included the clause against same-sex marriage. 
And that same year, as soon as the U.S. Supreme Court struck that down, Minnesota legalizes gay marriage. Minnesota that goes all the way back to Baker versus Nelson, where Minnesota said, you know, that they would not support it. But now they do support it in 2013. Twenty fifteen, Obergefell versus Hodges. This is the Supreme Court decision that overturned that that establishes same sex marriage as a right, redefines marriage, and legalizes it in the US. We've come a long way. Really fast. And then this is the interesting part, 2019. Massive study uh, published in Scientific American, the um, August 29, 2019, uh, author Sarah Reardon uh, published the massive study finds no single genetic cause of same-sex same -sex sexual behavior. This is a uh, study that was done over 20 years with half a million people uh, using uh, genetic databases which are now pretty prevalent and in existence and to point out that there is no evidence of a genetic basis for homosexual behavior. The genetic evidence that they're looking at is the same kind of thing that can be related to uh, what uh, skydiving, <laughs> uh, you know, doing reckless things. You know, I mean, what 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 does that tell you? Uh, it is not a matter of nature. Okay, where do we go from here? Well, we'll see where we go from here. I want to uh, do real quickly uh, talk about what concept of the person is behind it, and then we'll just open up for your comments here. All right, <clears throat> and this is Blazing's typical symbolic type of, you know, PowerPoint. So just kind of work with me here. I'll try to explain it. That's a person. <laughs> That square box. We're going to think of that square box as a person. That oval sphere, that's society. That's a person in society. And there's all kinds of other people that make up that society, right? Okay. Now, we can look at the person in terms of kind of an inner and outer person. Uh, kind of the, what Paul talks about, the inner man, the outer man, you want to refer to the soul and the, the whole soul body reality. Um, we just have this kind of this inner sense and the outer sense. And it is related to the fact that we have souls. But I'm, I'm just referring to the phenomena of kind of an inner, uh, we talk about in, the inner is the conscience. The inner is the inner mind and thinking and things related to the soul. And then um, through the body, there is expressed holistic action. Now, <clears throat> we're created by God. That's how we got here. And God created the world and all the people that are in the world. And not only has God created us, and by the way, this is what Romans 1 is saying, it, by virtue of creation, there is a recognition on the part of people, because we do have minds, perceiving in the things that were made, the power and the glory of God. And what ought we to do? We ought to give glory to God and submit ourselves to him. But God does not just leave us with the fact of creation and display of his power. There's also a, a special revelation that God gives of his word. 
And in the giving of his word, he teaches us. And what we talk about in terms of biblical morality, uh, what we ought to do and how we ought to live is defined in God's word. What we find is in individuals themselves, there is an inner sense of what is right to do. There is an inner moral direction. And this inner moral direction lines up more or less with God's revelation of his moral will. And it leads us to actions where we behave in certain ways that are more or less in accord with that moral will. But there's also a contrary inclination. And the letter to the Romans will talk about this problem of sin. Uh, and this contrary inclination leads to contrary activities contrary to the will and purpose of God. Now, we live in a world of which there are lots of other people, and there are social pressures coming on us, and these pressures sometimes line up with our moral sense. They somehow sometimes line up with what God reveals is right and wrong. But there's also pressures, social pressures, that are contrary to the revealed will of God and even one's own internal sense of what is right and what is wrong. Now, <clears throat> what if we remove God? We remove God from the picture. We have a culture that's developing in which God no longer is a factor in ethical considerations. And when that happens, how do you understand the person and the conflicting desires, moral desires, and, in, and thoughts of what's right and wrong within an individual? How is that to be understood and accounted for? And a, well, <clears throat> some would say, well, it comes from the society. So we learn our sense of right and wrong from other people. And so we have social pressures on us. And so we conform to them. That's true to some extent. But in uh, starting in the in the 70s, 1970s, there developed a sense of the person and the individual, which, um, which reconceived the individual as a, as a self that is trying to get free from social pressure. We developed a whole area of psychology known as humanistic psychology. It grew up very rapidly in the 70s and entered into many other disciplines in our culture. By the late 70s, educational philosophy had been reformed around humanistic psychology. So that the purpose in education is to develop individual selves and allow them to find self-fulfillment and self-actualize. Because what we have in the core of our inner being are selves struggling to get free. But actually they're inhibited. They're inhibited by the society, by social pressures, telling them to do this and don't do that. And these social structures inhibit the free development of a self. So we need to cancel out these wrong feelings here that develop from the society, and we need to allow a self to self-actualize. So we're going to reconceive the, the person here as a self that needs to, to get free. It has internal feelings that, that are not um, 
to be oppressed by the society. It needs to get them out and express them and bring them into action. You have to kind of imagine yourself and recreate and create yourself and bring yourself into being. And so <clears throat> there are social pressures that are coming upon you, but we need to we need to nix those things, okay? So we can allow this self to to express itself. You say, well, some of those social pressures are, are by law. We need to change those laws. Because we want to achieve authenticity. Ever heard that word? That's a relatively recent word. It comes out of the humanistic psychology developing in the 70s and on to today and going back into existential philosophy in the early 20th century, but it's not a term that most of us grew up with, but it's a recent term. We think of it, well, it means to be genuine. No, it doesn't just mean that. It's a technical term that refers to a self inventing itself without social pressure. It brings identity. We're, we are persons in the process of creating identity. Remember Justice O'Connor used that word in the Roe v. Wade decision uh, that we need to protect identity formation. So we're going to self-actualize and create our own identities by negating social pressures or laws that inhibit the development of our individual identity um, that's in the process of formation. But see, after a while, we realize that it's, this is not sufficient in itself. We actually need something from the society. We need recognition. Uh, we, we really can't. We really can't self-actualize to the full extent unless the society gives recognition. When you get recognition, that's affirmation. Well, the society has been saying, no, 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 no. You've got to cancel that out, change those laws. Now you need recognition. And people don't want to recognize it. You need to educate them or force them to do it because this is necessary for personal identity formation. Well, <clears throat> recognition also requires possibilities of existence, models. We need some models. Are other people, other people <laughs> finding the kinds of things that ourselves are interested in? Well, yeah, they're out there. They become the models. They say, well, there were, there were people saying, no, no, don't do that. Don't do, no, cancel that out. We need, to, we need to highlight some models of individual identity expression. And that helps with the recognition. By the way, this is identity politics. Heard that phrase? We need the politics of identity, the politics that affirm identity formation. Now the problem comes when there are others in the society who say, actually, you know what? There is no self there. There is no inner self. It doesn't really exist. We're all material beings. We've been talking about the self-actualization of inner selves. No, there really isn't an inner self. So what does that mean? <coughs> that means that this is all about power and social construction. That, and, and they really believe this. They're going to reconstruct society. And they're going to use power to do it because it suits their interest.
But what we need to recognize is there actually is a God. <laughs> and the actual choices that people are dealing with are only of two sorts. There's an accordance with the, cr the Creator's moral design. That's according to nature, Romans 1. Or there is sin against that order. And so if you cancel out the moral and say, well, that, that's contrary to my expressive nature, there's only one direction to go. And that is a direction of sin against God. That's what Romans 1 is about. But this is where our culture is and where it's thinking. Right? And we see a development taking place in law and in the perspectives uh, through the entertainment, the various cultural avenues that form and shape the thinking of our nation. But Romans 1 says that part of the judgment of God is to give a people over into their passions. And so it's a scary thing to see a culture going more and more and more in that direction. Now, I want to stop here and um, let you make comments, ask questions. This is uh, a lot of things here, but you may have some thoughts or questions that you'd like to ask. Barbara? Do we have uh, all the states voting against the Oberger Belt and all of that? And what people voted against it. And what happened to that? The courts come back and say, we don't care what you, the people, want. We are taking power. Yeah. Uh, uh, the people had put in uh, Law and actually, the Supreme Court itself had ruled that the law was valid against same-sex marriage. Prior to Obergefell, certain states were already um, uh, putting uh, statutes acknowledging same-sex marriage, leading up to Obergefell. But um, this is the Supreme Court striking down all laws that ban it. Okay. So and uh, so we voted to defend, uh, we voted to affirm the Defense of the Marriage Act. The Supreme Court said it doesn't matter. Yeah, that's right. They they they, they have the they have the authority to declare unconstitutional any legislative law. Even though in 2009 and 2019 you pointed out science, that said there is no genetic basis for this. But, you know, it, it, they just repeat the law. They, meaning the courts and the activists and the people taking power. They yeah. repeat the law and they won't even look at the truth, which is back to what God says. Yeah. The, the thing in the, in the Obergefell decision and also, uh, yeah, in the Obergefell decision, so was it Justice Kennedy that wrote the uh, for the uh, majority uh, uh, speak of uh, homosexual persons as as if they're a, a, an identity a class of person of the same category as uh, different ethnicities or other identities uh, and uh, that would seem to be a matter rooted in nature. You're, you're referring to liberty in the Constitution. And you're in a constitutional history that goes back, of course, to the Declaration of Independence with uh, rights given by the Creator. So there are liberties that are given by the Creator. The Creator is no longer remembered here in the legal decisions and identity status is being recognized. But what's happening uh, since 2015 
is uh, the scientific basis for uh, that identity has uh, evaporated. So what you have is uh, identity through identity creation through activity. I've created my own identity by my activity. Is this a constitutionally protected thing? Uh, that's 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 a that's a problem. Yes, over oh, here. Yeah, we have a microphone right there. More? Behind you. So I want to say this morning, um, during prayers, I was led to pray for the younger generation, um, especially the teenagers, the preteens, um, and just the children who are still trying to um, establish their identity and that God will protect them in their school, wherever they are, um, from all the pressures that the society um, tends to place on them, that they will hold on to the truth, um, which is that we do not exist apart from God. He is our creator, and we are defined by his work. And um, that they will, um, some of the children in their homes, they do have the word of God. Their parents um, are part of their family, their siblings. But even for the children who um, may not have them, um, may not have parents who believe in God, who know about Jesus Christ, that wherever they will be, that God will make a way, that they will hear about Jesus Christ, that they will not be, um, be moved around or um, be deterred from what is really the truth, that God loves them and that um, we do not exist apart from God. He is our creator. And the word of God defines who we are. And just like you spoke about this morning, um, um, Dr. Craig, we are, um, you know, we're not, we're not created contrary to nature. I mean, God um, created us as man and woman. And that's what he, that's, that's, that's the way it is. It's not different. Science cannot um, tell us anything apart from what God has already established. There is no genetic basis for um, the alterations or for um, anything that de that defines or tries to define um, as us as different from what God established from the very beginning. So my prayer this morning um, was that God will protect the young people. Um, they are the leaders for tomorrow. And there is so much pressure and so much influence um, out there. Sometimes we don't even know what the, children's, what the children go through. And even in the schools, um, I'm from Kenya, that's where I grew up, and we prayed in school. Um, we started off with the Lord's Prayer, and I'm so thankful that that was ingrained in me. And even with um, um, where I am and, and where God is leading me, um, I see a lot going on, but I'm so thankful because of what I have in me, the foundation that I have in me. And so when I see the little children, the younger people, my prayer is that God protect them. You know, let them hear about you from some place, if it's in church, if it is in their schools, and let them know um, that you love them and that you have a plan for them. Not what the world dictates, not what um, is trying to lead them away from the truth and what you have for them. So that's my prayer um, this morning. And I would just um, pray that we would remember the younger people as we pray um, you know, in your families and um, wherever you are, just remember the children. That God will protect them, and that they will not be led astray. Thank you. Thank you, Dorothy. Absolutely. Um, and we need to to pray for them. Look, uh, already in uh, uh, around 2001, 2003, national uh, educational uh, what is it? The the NEA National Education Association. Um, uh, <coughs> develop policies for educating in the, in the primary and secondary schools uh, about homosexual lifestyle as a legitimate, you know, uh, lifestyle. And this is all under the, the structure of an educational system that's concerned that, that self-actualized self contrary to pressuring tradition. 
and clean the home. You know, the home is uh, gives a, a pressure uh, on the self-actualizing self that can retard it. And so it needs to hear, it needs to hear possibilities of existence that are beyond those things. And so they want to help it uh, self-actualize in another direction. We need to pray for the children. And uh, the, we face an issue for uh, homes um, that we've come to in this country within the past <clears throat> 30 years that just was not the case before then. And you need to know that this is uh, intentional, <laughs> all right? It is a, uh, an exercise of, of power um, in our, an attempted and the education of the children. So we do need to pray, and thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, look, we need to pray for wisdom, <clears throat> for uh, we need wise governing authorities, we need wise people in Congress, we need wise judges. Um, I'm thankful that we're getting judges that uh, hopefully do not have the kind of inventive activism <laughs> that has been the case in, for many in the past. We need to pray for wisdom in the nation. But we especially need, and I appreciate your, your uh, prayer, we need to pray for the power of the gospel. And this is where we want to leave this. Our section is Romans 1, 18 to 32, and Paul talks about the wrath of God revealed because of the unrighteous of men who suppress the truth, suppression of the truth. And the result of that is a degradation that goes more and more. Homosexuality is not the only sin. He ends with all kinds of things, from murder to malice to just the whole slew of human evil. <coughs> 